Yes. Now we're live. Hello, greetings and salutations. And uh, as I said on my various announcement announcements, um, with any luck, this will continue without problems despite the uh, power outage and storms. And you won't get to hear my version of either King Lear or The Tempest, because um, things are exciting here. But um, welcome, and thank you very much for coming to our discussion tonight. We are talking about uh, history while writing mystery. And with me, I have some wonderful uh, panelists, compadres. Um, I'll start with Naomi Hirahara, who is an Edgar Award-winning author of multiple traditional mystery series and war short stories. Her Masarai's mysteries, which have been published in Japanese, Korean, and French, feature a Los Angeles gardener and Hiroshima survivor who solves crimes. The seventh and final Masarai mystery is Hiroshima Boy, which was nominated for an Edgar Award for Best Paperback Original. Her first historical mystery, Clark and Division, follows a Japanese-American family's move to Chicago in 1944 after being released from a California wartime detention center. Laurie R. King is the New York Times bestselling author of 30 novels and other works, including the Mary Russell Sherlock Holmes stories, beginning with The Beekeeper's Apprentice, which was named one of the 20th century best crime novels by the IMBA. She's won the Agatha Anthony Edgar, Lambda, Wolf, McCavity, Creasy Dagger, and the Romantic Times Career Achievement Awards, has an honorary doctorate in theology, and has been the guest of honor at several mystery conventions. And yes, she is a Baker Street Irregular. Mm -hmm. S.J. Roseanne is a native New Yorker and the author of 16 novels and six dozen short stories. She, her work has won the Edgar, Seamus, Anthony Nero, and McCavity Awards for Best Novel, and the Edgar for Best Short Story. She's also the recipient of the Japanese Maltese Falcon and Private Eye Writers of America Life Achievement Award. She too is a member of the Baker Street Irregulars. Uh, I'm Dana Cameron. Uh, I write uh, historical fiction, noir, urban fantasy, traditional mystery, thriller, but it all draws from my experience in historical archeology. span um, I've won Agatha's, Anthony's, McCavity's, and I've earned a nomination. And um, the reason we're here today is to talk about historical fiction um, and historical mystery in particular, because my, uh, my latest is forthcoming, Pandora's Orphans, which will be out July 13th. And I realized that when I was collecting the Fangborn stories, even though they're urban fantasy stories set, uh, uh, you know, uh, in our world, so to speak, uh, more than half of them have historical connections. And part of that is my fault as a recovering archaeologist. And part of it is just I can't help myself. And I'm curious about these things. And all the, our, uh, our, our panelists are, too. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming here. So uh, Naomi, SJ, and Laurie, were you an expert in your historical period before you started writing it? And if not, how did you come to be able to write the characters and settings so convincingly? Gonna call her names, Dana, or just butt in? Just, just jump in. I want this to be a conversation if we can. <laughs> yeah, I love the idea of being an expert in the historical period. No, I, I, I sort of backed into the whole thing, wanting to write a story about a young woman who meets Sherlock Holmes, and so I was, I was condemned to begin it um, at a, at the, the age when. <clears throat> Conan Doyle, that previous author, was finished with him. So that set me for 1915. And, and no, I knew nothing about 1915. I, I had just finished a, uh, a master's degree in, um, in Old Testament, which is not exactly the same historical period. And so, <laughs> but you know, once an academic, always an academic. And so you just kind of keep researching and you find stuff out. So yeah, I know a fair amount of about the teens and 20s now. Didn't then. Mm -hmm. SJ? Um, I've done a, a couple of mysteries that could be counted as historicals, and I knew next to nothing about each period when I started. Uh, the Shanghai Moon has a considerable uh, historical background in World War II Shanghai. Paper Sun goes back mm -hmm. to Mississippi in the 1920s, and I'm working on a project now set in London in 1924. I knew zero, but I was intrigued each time with whatever was going on, with, with whatever scrap I found. And uh, I, I found a book 
of a, a memoir uh, in a in a bookstore on on the uh, on the remainder shelf of a woman who'd lived in the Jewish ghetto in Shanghai in World War II. And I said, the what? I read that. And I thought, oh, is there ever a book here? And then I went and read everything else I could find. And that's how I've been doing it. Uh, for the one I'm working on now, 1924, I'm reading things like Mrs. Dalloway, uh, mm -hmm. books written at the time. I'm also reading vast amounts of, of uh, this writer named Laurie King, uh, who has- We've heard of her, I think. There. Yeah. yeah, she's rather good. Uh, and okay. I'll take trying not to steal things out of her books. So. Actually, it's the Laurie King Lending Library that is the more important section. Oh, yeah. oh. the Laurie King Lending Library. You see behind me, <laughs> there's a pile there. That's the Laurie King Lending Library. Yeah. So that's how so did I you? How I did you get the books? How did I? How did you get the books uh, from Laurie from the other coast? Laurie shipped them out here because she is a freaking hero. That is, and and yeah. I am using them like stick them in a box and you mail them, <laughs> and, and and then How you pick them up at the other end. It's oh. fabulous. Um, so no, I was nowhere near an expert, and I'm still nowhere near an expert. Um, at, at this point, may I quote uh, Tom Clancy mm -hmm. from The Hunt for Red October? Okay. When someone asked him, "How do you know so much about nuclear submarines? This is all classified material." And he said, well, the truth is, I only know 16 things about nuclear submarines, <laughs> but they're all in the book. <laughs> <laughs> the iceberg theory of writing. How about you, Naomi? Well, I guess um, because of my background as a journalist, as well as a, I kind of graduated from journalism to be a social historian, <laughs> now a mystery writer. So actually, um, I have done a lot of research in like Clarkin Division is set in World War II. It's the Japanese American, you know, uh, incarceration experience. So I knew a lot about it, not from my own family because my family was not incarcerated. They were in Japan at the time, but um, through my work at the newspaper. And I think there's something for me, I'd like to um, get information and put it in nonfiction first and there's something about uh, putting names exact names to these events that happened and and then when I get that out of the way I feel like I have permission to just make things up and then I think and but I'm not an ex you know I think in terms of expert I think when you do more research you realize that how much you don't know and new <laughs> things kind of pop up so I, I don't know about expert but I had done a lot of research prior. Yeah, it's it's funny because uh, when I started writing fiction, um, I was always kind of distraught because people would put me on these research panels. And I'm like, I didn't do any research for my books. <laughs> and then I realized, no, no, I spent 20 years doing historical archaeology and that kind of counts. Yeah. Um, but then um, I, w again, when I was working on this collection, I realized, okay, more than those, half of those are historical. Most of the short stories I've written have some historical or archaeological context. The Anna White stories, which are set in um, in 18th century Boston, uh, and it just if I don't know about the period, I kind of want to find out about it. So it's just one of those things where you do you do the best you can, and if you have a jumping off point from someone who's willing to lend you their library or having done a history degree or a journalism degree. Um, then you sort of have the tools all set to uh, to go on and work with that. But it's it's fun to root around, and I mean research is fun. I think um, it can be a, it can be a black hole. Um, what is the coolest thing that you've learned about doing uh, the periods that you're currently writing, going to write, um, have written, and were you able to use it in in your work? Because sometimes you find out really neat stuff and you can't put it into your work because it doesn't fit or it seems too improbable. So do you have an example of something like that? I do. Oh, do. I do. Um, there, in, in, again, with the, with the Shanghai book and the Shanghai, uh, the historical part is only about half the, the, the wordage in the book and it was a, a particular story, but there was a uh, huge, uh, international community in, in Shanghai during the war. 
Uh, it, it, many of them were incarcerated, many of them were not. There had been a huge white Russian influx before the war, after World War I and the, and the uh, Russian Revolution. And there was a former count, a Russian count, who made his living in the nightclubs of Shanghai as a clown and made a side living as a spy for four or five different sides. And I had no use for him. I had no room for him. He was so fabulous. And I just, I keep thinking I'm gonna write a whole nother Shanghai book just so I can put him in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's too, I mean, he must have been very adept at A, being a nobleman and surviving, and then B, being able to uh, negotiate all the triple and double and quadruple crosses that. There were, there were a lot of, of Russian nobles who were waiters and uh, seamstresses by then. Mm. Oh, yeah. So they, they deserve a whole book of their own. Anybody writing Russian stuff out there? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, any time that you're setting a book in a, in a real life historical period, um, which um, all of all of mine, I mean, mine are fantasies, but they're um, they're set in real times and with real people. As, as there's always a, a few actual historical figures in the books, and it's it's always such a joy to come across somebody that uh, that will fit with the book that you're going to try and write, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not a I'm not an outliner. I don't plan books far, far in advance. I depend on coming across people that I, I grab by their collars and say, ha, you're coming with me. And <laughs> they, they show up as, you know, the, the governor of Jerusalem or um, the, the fact that, uh, <clears throat> that Dashiell Hammett was in San Francisco just when I needed him to be. Or, you know, I mean, it's just such a joy. And you think, oh, good. Thank you for thank you for arranging history to my convenience. It was funny because I wasn't sure whether you're talking about historical characters or actual people in your life. It's like, nope, okay, you know about this. You're coming with me, and sort of just strong arming them off. Like Naomi, I think what really helped me. So Clark and Division. It's set in Chicago in 1944, and that was kind of the way station for Japanese Americans um, being released from the 10 camps. And um, so it started out, there was only 400 Japanese Americans before World War II. And then by the mid forties, there are 20,000. So you can imagine it was um, quite an experience for all parties. And I think what really helped was for me to actually be there and be guided by, um, you, you, you have these community guides and mine was, a man um, younger than me who just loves history, Eric Matsunaga. And he was so kind to take me to this neighborhood, Clark and Division. And although not much was left, he had done oral histories and he could share with me. And there were a few, you know, there was like to, to show you how much the neighborhood has, had changed. Um, they, it used to have a lot of apartment buildings where people like the Japanese Americans lived. And now there was a building that said like LA tanning you know, tanning salon, it's still there. <laughs> I checked. <laughs> um, but there was a one building, uh, the Mark Twain Hotel, a historic building. And because um, I'm from LA, you know, he was kind of reticent. It's like um, HUD um, um, uh, housing now, you know, you know, to go in. And I'm just like, oh no, let's go in. I just, you know, walk, th this is what journalists do, just walk in. And he's kind of looking around, oh, this is the first time for me to be in here. And I think those kind of details just helped me imagine mm -hmm. what it was like for people. So that was helpful. Yeah. It's funny because I always, I always have the urge to put language that's appropriate to the period in there and inevitably sticks out in a bad way for my beta readers and everything. Like, why? Well, I'm like, no, but it's the perfect word. It's exactly what everyone was using. They're like, yeah, we don't like it. We don't get it. I'm like, but, 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 he says, it's English. I bet there are lots of other words that sound very similar or express the same thing. You can do that. But it's, I find it difficult sometimes to, but it's so accurate and it's historically, it's like uh, trying to remember that it's an adventure story or a fantasy of some sort and or mystery and you need to be carried along with it in the meantime and not um, necessarily be checking out the footnotes and the accuracy of the research 
as it were. At some point, though, I am going to write a mystery with a whole flock of footnotes and a bibliography. Just because. <laughs> I once did an event fun. with uh, with Andrew Taylor, who, you know, I'm. It was in Cambridge with Andrew Taylor, and and uh, and so we discussed just this point. Um, and he was of the firm opinion that if you could justify it by research, you you should use it. Mm -hmm. And I was of the viewpoint that you have to consider that these are modern readers that are looking at it. And you, you don't want to use something that whether it's an invention or a phrase or an attitude um, that kicks someone out of the narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you have to find this balance between accuracy and uh, you know, I remember a, a, an early editor questioned my worst, my use of the word mellow. Well, mellow is an old word, mm -hmm. but because of the kind of 60s connotations of mellow, she just said, could you find a, a word that doesn't sound like the 20th century? So, I That's an interesting problem because not only are you dealing with what was accurate then, it's, it's what ha the word has taken on to mean since then. And you have to, it's like you're considering all, all the whole span of that, uh, of the, the, the history of that word, of that language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone else looked like they wanted to say something? No? Well, actually, you lead me quite nicely, Laurie. Thank you very much. Um, and so my next question was, how do you, uh, what's the trick you use for balancing the historical elements so the mystery doesn't get bogged down? Um, how do you avoid the exposition dump, or what I like to think of as the, the pig and the python problems, when the python eats the pig and then there's a big lump of pig that just keeps going, stops everything in the meantime, which is a very visceral and unfortunate expression I'll never use again, I apologize. So, <laughs> I like now, let me start with you. Oh. I, I think it, for me, it's helped to have <laughs> an, a knowing character, you know, or to have conflict between characters. Um, and then the sensibilities of the, the time just naturally come out in that conflict, in the dialogue. Um, with Clark and Division, I have a woman who, a young woman who's in her 20s. She's somewhat sheltered. And then all these you know, world events kind of happen to her and Chicago is new to her. So there's all these characters that some are more worldly, you know, and so when she says something naive, they could kind of correct, no, that, that's not really how it is. You know, it's like this, you know. So um, that's the way I kind of like to parse out um, these kind of details. Like the that. clash of characters. Yeah. yeah, I like that a lot because it's, I think a lot of us would default to having a character who is a child or an outsider come in and have play that role, but I like the idea of a, of a conflict with two different points of view, someone within the same community. Yeah, I, I, I tend to have someone who doesn't know the place, so someone else can explain to that person what I really want to explain to my reader. Um, but, but it also has to be handled delicately. You don't want them explaining too much. And, and some things everyone just knows. So everyone in the time just knows, so you can't have anyone explain it. And your reader just has to, has to catch on. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, that was really hard uh, in the Shanghai book, not so hard in, in the other ones, um, but there was so much I wanted to say. Yeah. And I knew nobody knew the time, just like I didn't know the time. Uh, the Mississippi book was, was easier because people know more about that time. What they didn't know is that there were Chinese in Mississippi which I also didn't. But was it was it harder or was it uh, was it easier or was it harder because people were more familiar with a more modern setting in this country? It was easier. It was easier. Okay. Also that book, although a lot of it was about what happened in the past, uh, those stories were all told. You, you never actually saw the past. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay. it, it, that was that was that was easier. The one I'm doing now is uh, <laughs> because it's all new to me. I, I you know, want want to explain it to everybody else too. And then there was, you know, I can't do that. This is where I take my lesson from Laurie King. You see, who, oh, who, yeah. uh, 
And I think it also helps if you're talking about, for example, technology. I mean, there's, you're kind of aware going into a 20s book that the technology will be different. But especially if you're, if you're speaking of, for example, Britain to an American audience, sometimes you have to take care to use phrases that are substitutes or translations without saying, I mean, um, so that when you're talking about the first floor in Britain, that's the first floor above the ground. In America, it's the ground floor. So mm -hmm. you have to sort of make sure that you're, that your wording goes with what it actually is and it doesn't create confusion. And if you have something that is a, a piece of technology that you kind of need to explain, um, it's better not to just explain it, but to explain somebody's reaction to it. So that if I'm, if I'm making a trunk call in the 20s, I, I, I don't need to explain to my readers that it has to go through these various exchanges along the way, it's better if I explain that I'm irritated at the thought of all these exchanges along the way, listening in on my call or something like that. You know, that it's, it's my personal reaction that tells you something, but it's only offhandedly informing you that there's exchanges along the way, things like that. Yeah, it's another, it's another uh, example of conflict where you can just like have the reaction to something um, be, it's like, it's not what I'm doing. You know, why do I have to dial this phone with all these numbers on it? Um, as, and why doesn't I just, why don't I just talk into the phone? Um, I'm still learning how to talk to my phone. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, I, I think it's, I think it's a tricky thing because, you know, I think coming from different uh, investigative and researchy backgrounds. And SJ, I would count art and architecture with that. Um, we all have the inclination to have all, you know, want to show all the good stuff. But um, I think about how to sneak some material in. And sometimes I will use someone's response to a technology or an expression or something as a way to hide a clue. Um, mm. if like if they're so busy being amazed that uh, someone asked to um, to borrow a rubber if they were in the UK, and Americans would be gasping and clutching pearls, but it means to borrow an eraser. Um, I know that I was clutching pearls the first time I was asked if I would loan someone. I did money. not know that, and I was thinking, <laughs> borrow? <laughs> a, you're assuming that I have one, and B, that I'm willing to- We had to an English money. exchange student and when I was in high school. We had an English exchange student who turned to the boy next to her and said, may I borrow your rubber? <laughs> yeah, it, it took me a minute. Fortunately, there was someone uh, there who had done, uh, who had been an au pair in the U.S. and said, no, 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 it's cool. Stand down, red alert, because I was like climbing the wall, like what, what is going on in this crazy country? Um, but in that moment, I would sneak in a clue that someone else or, you know, someone else notices or something else. So you're, you're so busy being caught up in that moment of either, uh, shock or humor or outrage or whatever that you can sort of sneak a clue in. And I think that's, so. I took that from um, John Cleese when he was talking about writing uh, comedy for Faulty Towers. And he was talking about the fact that he'd have these incredibly complex structures where something horrible and embarrassing and ultimately humiliating was gonna happen to Basil Faulty at the end. But every time there was a clue, he'd put it in a joke. So it was always distracting the audience from the inevitability mm -hmm. that um, of how it's going to stop. And I'm like, that's good. I'm going to steal that. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we each have a take a moment and talk about the historical mystery that is has just come out, Laurie, or that's about to come out, Naomi, or you're working on, SJ? And you know, tell me, was it an idea that was in your head for a while? Did it come in a flash? What was it inspire you and what was the hardest part about it for you personally or as a writer? I'll start because you started with me. Um, I, did. I, did. I did. Castle Castle Shade, which the picture is on the wall behind me. Um, the characters, Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes, end up in um, Eastern Europe in Transylvania um, doing a task for the Queen of Romania. And I... I 
like most of my books, I stumble across a piece of information that acts kind of like the grit in at the key at the center of a of a pearl. You know, you just can't quite get rid of it. It just sits there and sits there and sits there, and pretty soon things accrete to it. And so, the, in this case, it was I was off on a uh, on a tour with Barbara and Rob from the Poison Pen in uh, in Scottsdale, and we, we went off into Transylvania and came to this tower. I mean, this castle, and it was all, there was all these weird vampire stuff attached to it. I found later that it was during the communist era. They decided they needed dollars, and so they called this Dracula's castle, which had nothing to do with anything. But that's okay. Um, so you sort of make it past all this Dracula and the teeth dripping and all the rest of it, and up to this castle, which was a really cool, very small castle. Wandering through these various, I couldn't have told you what floor I was on at any given time. Through this room with this fabulous tile fireplace, and here on the side is this little black and white old uh, photograph, just kind of sitting there in a little frame, like a family display, of this regal-looking woman, the Queen of Romania, and the person who's giving us a tour mentions that this Queen Marie and the English Queen, and I'm thinking. English Queen, Transylvania. This, there's definite possibilities here. So, you know, you come across somebody like that, it, you can't, you can't like tweet Queen Marie of Transylvania go. I mean, you really can't. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you grabbed her, you, you carried her along with you. Yeah, I said, do you mind? So, you know. <laughs> Naomi, tell me about your inspiration for uh, for Clark and Division. Um, well, what in terms of the uh, resettlement in Chicago, I had co-written a book with a friend of mine called Life After Manzanar. So that's when mm -hmm. it became more apparent. I had a lot of friends who had spent time in Chicago, Japanese Americans, and I never put two and two together. You know, at the time, it was the second biggest city. I mean, I'm in LA, so we're like, we're number two. But back then, we were number three. <laughs> and it was in the middle of the country, and there was, you know, defense industry. There was a lot of a need for jobs. So that's why it became the center for the resettlement. Um, but I was always um, wanting to write a story from a Nisei woman's perspective in the 40s and was thwarted. I, I started a novel that I couldn't sell. And um, I had, it was told like from six women's points of view and the editors were saying, we can't really tell the difference between these women. And they were all attracted to the femme fatale. And then I had also done a short story for Megan Abbott kind of um, set in that time period too. And it was a very, it was a Nisei woman who gets an illicit affair with a white guy and then she ends up, um, she, she was married and committed adultery and then her, her husband was mysteriously killed and she thinks it was her, this, her lover. So she ends up chopping him up in little pieces and putting them in a suitcase and submerging it into the space. As you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not a story for everyone, but I, I go like the community <laughs> cannot relate to this. So, you know, so I was really trying to write an every woman kind of naive um, woman who, you know, is going through this uh, li life altering experience, the younger sister, yeah. you know, I was telling the story of the younger sister, which was actually, that was really hard for me because I'm the older sister and I don't have any sisters. I only have a brother who's eight and a half years younger than me. So even more than some of the cultural things, it was getting into the mindset of my character. I, I will have to say that was my biggest challenge. And I had to even interview my girlfriends who are younger sisters to really get into her head. There's a big switch in family dynamic from being the oldest to being the youngest. And of course, if it's brothers or sisters, everything else makes a huge difference. So yeah, well, that's that's cool. I, I so you did have a, a sort of beginning sense of where you wanted to go. Well, yeah, of a of a subject that you wanted to, or uh, a time period that you wanted to tackle. Nifty, SJ. Yeah, Talk I already to told you the story of of the Shanghai book. Um, Paper Sun came about. Paper Sun is is the one uh, set in the Mississippi Delta, and it came about because I was visiting a friend in the Mississippi Delta. And I, he uh, knew I was Jewish and he knew I was a photographer. So he took me to the Jewish cemetery in Clarksdale 
And that did not surprise me that it was there because there, the Jews were the, uh, the uh, dry goods traders up and down the Mississippi. So we're taking photographs. It's beautiful, old cemetery. And he said, tomorrow we're going down to Greenville for dinner at this fabulous steak place back behind on the wrong side of the tracks and all that. And we can go, there's a much bigger Jewish cemetery there, so we can go take photographs there too if you want. And then he said the magic words. He said, and it's right across the street from the, the this, that cemetery is right across the street from the Chinese cemetery, so we can go there too. And I said, the what? I said, there, there, there are, are enough Chinese in the Delta to have their own cemetery? And he said, well, yeah, you know, the grocers. <laughs> what do you mean, you know, the grocers? So we went there. He told me everything he knew. He introduced me to a couple of the uh, remaining grocers. Uh, that, that community is largely gone, but I met some representatives of it who are still there. I came back to New York and read everything I could find on the Mississippi Chinese, which is a reasonably substantial amount. And then there's a lot of tangential places where they're mentioned in other books. I went back to Mississippi three times. That was, um, so that's where it started, was with uh, Eric Stone saying, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, saying, you know, the grocers. <laughs> the book I'm doing now, uh, mm -hmm. The Murder of Mr. Ma, came to me uh, via a, um, a uh, phone call from my agent who and Dana, you know, you know this story. Who said we're agents in law? We're Josh yeah. and laws. Yeah. Who said that he had a guy who uh, had just signed on with him who had an idea that uh, he wanted uh, to co-write, and uh, it was about a Chinese writer in London in 1924. And I said, "Sure, have him call me." <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and the rest is history. This is the most fun project <laughs> I have ever done. But it, that's how it came to me. I would not have uh, probably found this on my own. Yeah. It's funny how it's like someone says, so, hey, you you do this, right? And like, sure. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, if there, there are some things that people would say, hey, you want to work on this? And I'd say, get this, just not me. But this right. was so perfect that I couldn't not. Right. It's, um, it's interesting. And, in terms of writing historical, um, I wrote one historical short story. Uh, it features a character that shows up in the Emma Fielding mysteries. And she's uh, an English woman who's transplanted to Massachusetts. And Emma is studying one of her houses. So I wrote a short story with her because my editor at the time said, oh gosh, we're doing a collection of, um, of mysteries with a holiday miracle and holiday spirit. And, romance and i'm like no one comes to me for romance and they don't come to me for holiday spirit and she says she'll do that i'm like absolutely i will and i wrote it it was it was okay i i, I left a lot of detail in it but it ended up being a nice um nice little way of think about writing historical and that was um in sugar plums and scandal i can't remember the name of it oh my gosh because it was a long time ago but then the next time i was having lunch with a friend and they said oh you know someone just dropped out of uh, the Boston Noir collection. Wow. Uh, you you write short stories. And at that point, I think I had one and a half. I'm like, sure, of course I do. And so I uh, I wrote um, the, the idea with the Akashic City series, and I'm sure you all are familiar with them. It's, it's really cool. There's a series of usually crime writers, mystery writers, thrill writers, and local writers who write, they take a particular neighborhood in a city and they uh, they write a story set there. And so I was thinking, okay, I've spent a lot of time in Boston and I spent a lot of time in Kenmore Square because I went to BU. I'm like, what am I gonna do, write academic noir? No, I've lived that, I'm, I'm done, I'm out. And I'm like, wait a minute, the 18th century happened in Boston, it happened in a lot of places. I've been studying that. And so what I decided to do was take what would look like to the casual reader as being uh, and. Uh, a traditional 1940s golden age noir story about an embattled blonde on the waterfront who owns a tavern. And I said it in 1740. Um, and I was, I put all my fear and panic in it because I only had a couple weeks to write it and it was being written, uh, it was being edited by Dennis Lehane. So you can understand that there was fear, terror, um, trepidation, uncertainty, doubt, all that good stuff. And um, 
it worked out and I fell in love with the character. Didn't realize quite how broken she was, but Anna Hoyt um, appeared in several other stories. In terms of writing the Fangborn, um, I never expected to be writing urban fantasy, werewolves and vampires, but when Charlene Harris and Tony Kellner ask you to write a werewolf story, you say, yes, I will do that and thank you. The so first, The first paranormal I ever wrote was for that same book, Charlene and, and Tony said, will yep. you write us a paranormal? And my first thought was, I don't write paranormal. And my second thought was, Charlene Harris is asking <laughs> yeah. Lori, Jack <laughs> <laughs> And that's the thing. It's like, and they were, they were good friends before this. So it's like, well, yeah, great. And all of a sudden I'm panicking because as an academic, I'm like looking around, I'm like, I don't have any, where are my reference books on, on vampires and werewolves? What am I going to do? And it took me a solid 20 minutes of sweating and shaking to realize, wait a minute. And this is after I'd written six novels. I can make this up. <laughs> and it was one of those things that's like, kathunk, kathunk, the machinery sort of clanked in the, into, into gear. But but Dana, that's interesting because I didn't know that that was where Anna Hoyt came from. That was the first Anna Hoyt was in yeah. uh, Boston Noir. Yeah. And she has never left you. She has never left me. She yeah. showed up in Cape Cod Noir and I think two issues of Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. And she is violent and wonderful and people worry that she's coming from me. And with any luck in a, a year or so, I hope to have the Anna Hoyt novel coming out yeah, from DCLA too. I was gonna say, there's a novel that I there cannot. Is. Yeah. yeah, and it, it almost ended me to write it because she's not a fun person to hang out with. <laughs> Enough about that. Um, I want to yeah, talk about- happens, And what happens if somebody likes that novel enough that they say, do you have another one in you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing is that um, our agent, the amazing Josh Getzler, as you know, SJ, said, okay, well, you know, maybe have a standalone, that's great. Um, and then he says, could you do two? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Well, maybe. And then it comes back a couple of weeks later after I said maybe. It's like, could you do three? <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you're really good at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have thoughts of what I could do if um, if if another one's needed. Sherlock Holmes. Laurie, obviously that's the bailiwick that most people know you for these days, though I suspect uh, there's a lot of fans of, was it Kate Martinelli as well? Um, <laughs> Was it Victorian history or Sherlock that first inspired you? I think it was Sherlock Holmes. And then I want to talk about all the rest of us who have had the chance to write a Sherlock Holmes story because of Laurie and Les Klinger. Yeah, you're part of the industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was, I started writing them in, <clears throat> in the 80s. Um, and I think the... Um, I think that you know the Sunday night uh, mysteries must have been on during the time. We seem to be having an echo here. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and um, I wanted to write the coming of age story of a young woman with that spectacular mind. And I wanted to look at what what would that mind look like in a young female feminist 20th century person, as opposed to a Victorian male. Mm -hmm. And then because it's always more interesting to put two similar things next to each other, I thought, let's, let's put her, you know, if you're writing a coming of age story, let's have her coming of age in the vicinity of the original himself. And so that's, that's where that series came from. It's, um, looking at her and you know over the years I've become more interested in him as a character but I, I you know in the first half dozen he was purely a supporting actor um, now I think it's more the two of them and, and he interests me as a character but, so. mm -hmm. but yeah I did um, Les Klinger and I do a series of uh, anthologies that are all based on the idea of of asking successful writers who are not known for writing Sherlock Holmes to write a story inspired by the Sherlock Holmes canon, and um, and I we have roped in all kinds of unusual, <laughs> <laughs> including everyone here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Naomi, let's start with you. 
you 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 took the point of view of a um, a modern day RA at Stanford University. Can you tell me a little bit about um, why you chose that particular a, a angle? It's it's kind of a um, it's kind of an origin story almost. I'm wondering if there's more on the way. Well, as it turns out, and it was said in the 1980s, and it mm -hmm. turns out. I was an RA at Stanford in the 1980s. Oh, <laughs> you know what? It seems what, what I've been doing, like every other story I write, and usually it comes at a time where I'm deep in other deadlines, they're very autobiographical. Mm -hmm. And I just say, okay, I'm just writing my autobiography through these short stories. And I think with, uh, and also I had the same experience you had with Charlene Harris and Tony Kellner in terms of, uh, you know, Les Klinger, who I call my Tim uh, Gunn, because, you know, he, he got me into uh, MWA, uh, Southern California chapter presidency. So he's my big mentor. And of course, Lori King, are, they're asking for a Sherlock Holmes story. So of course I have to deliver. And it's like, okay, I'll just take it from my own experience with a twist. And um, and then with the, you know, I was reading the Sherlock Holmes stories, like they don't all end in murder, you know, some of them are very, you know, so it's like, I'm just going to play around with it, you know, so that that's kind of the tact I went through. And I think it works. It's it's fun. Yeah. yeah. For sure, I, I, I like the, the fact that a it's uh, has a computer uh, science student in there and you have with the story of what uh, endless loop. Yeah. And everyone sort yeah. of Yeah, infinite loop. Infinite, infinite loop. loop. That's it. That's I, it. I, and I did take computer a computer science class and I did get in an in, infinite loop. So I, I knew yeah. This so this didn't require that much research. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I, I had that same experience. You know, Laurie and, and Les asked me for a story and I said, Oh my god, yes. Uh and then I said, uh <laughs> So I, I thought about the stories in the canon that that jumped out at me. That is, I, I thought, well, I could reread, but let me think which are my favorite before I reread things. And uh, the man, the the man with the twisted lip, mm -hmm. I always thought was was kind of amazing. And it's set in Limehouse, uh, mm -hmm. or a lot of it is, which is the Chinese quarter. And I thought, okay. And, and the other interesting thing about that story, which is the one I based mine on, is that it is basically told when it's over. Yeah. There, there is, there's nothing that gets, there's, there's nothing that, that Holmes uh, changes really in, in the course of investigating the, the, the situation. And I thought, okay, what could that mean if Holmes himself were being used as a tool by the opium den owners of Limehouse. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the story behind the story. And and that was that was how I did that, which which is one of my favorite ways to work anyway. It was looking at Sherlock Holmes from an outsider's yeah, from, point of view from, from and way outside. Yeah. And uh, in fact Holmes himself never actually comes into the story, mm -mm. except as as he's kind of being used. Uh, so. and, and expresses an interest in breakfast with enthusiasm. Yes, yes. well, Very and, and, and who wouldn't? Um, yeah. I, I do want to say, however, that uh, because the book I'm writing now uh, with, with, with John, the, the one set in 1924, uh, Holmes was still around London in 1924, and so uh, he drops into the book. He and Watson yeah. drop into the book, and yeah. uh, and play. Uh, I had them playing mahjong, but but John wants them to play something else, so they'll play some other game. So I just I just thought I'd you know, he is he is, uh, you know, he's having a wonderful time. So good, 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 good. Yeah, it was funny because um, I. <laughs> I had asked Les to look at the Fangborn story I wrote, um, the curious case of Miss Amelia Vernet, um, because I just it was my first time writing uh, in a uh, Sherlockian pastiche, and I was a little you know nervous as one one is, and I was writing it. Um, I wanted to see the Fangborn in Victorian London. I said, "Hey, Sherlock Holmes, Victorian London. Why does Watson forget 
so many things like his number of wives and their names and where his wound was and why are there so many inconsistencies like oh because clearly there's a fangborn a fangborn vampire changing his memory <laughs> and les was very gracious he read it and, and he says so um is this under contract to anyone and i'm like yeah it is he goes oh it's a pity because i'd buy it in a heartbeat i'm like okay thanks and so then later on he and laurie asked me and i wrote another pastiche um where there is honey and what i had i'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm thinking back what laurie was saying in terms of thinking about holmes as a character because the reason i think a lot of writers are interested in the character in the books is because of the character he and watson are middle class, if not actually well-born. If they're strapped for money, they are certainly well-educated, this, that, and the other thing. And yet they make a point of hanging out with the worst people in society, whether they are um, the Baker Street regulars, the, the folks in Limehouse opium dens or at the top of society. And so why? Why would they do that? What is in them? And so I wanted to write that as a noir. And uh, that was fun because for me, noir has you always have the person, uh, the, the focus of your story, faced with a number of very bad choices. There is seldom a good choice. And if there is a good choice, then they never would screw it up for themselves. I'm like, perfect for these guys. And so it was, it was fun for me. I think, um, I say fun. Everyone reverts their bad habits and um, gets more in debt, but you know, in a literary kind of fun way, <laughs> but um, I was I was really grateful for that because it was um, another way of looking at that friendship, and I think that's the thing that a lot of us are drawn to is that relationship between um, Holmes and Watson. Laura, is there anything Dana, you want to... Dana, yours was in Echoes of Sherlock Holmes. That's Naomi, right. Naomi, which one was yours in? It was the one that was published last year. In the company of yeah. And SJ's was a study in Sherlock. Study in Sherlock, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You, I may have done you lose track, huh? Names. <laughs> well, there's, there's five of them, and I, 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 I can't keep track of what, what we named them. It's the first one I tend to remember, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. but yes. <laughs> the color was blue. <laughs> yeah, my cover was yellow. <laughs> Actually, that was one yeah. of my, my introductions to um, to the Baker Street Irregulars weekend. Was I I was on an emergency New York trip because there were there were two exhibits I wanted to see. I wanted to have a meeting with my agent, and a study in Sherlock was coming out in paperback. And so Laurie and S J and Jan. Uh, sure. Burke and a bunch of folks were signing, including Neil Gaiman himself. And I'm like, I should go there. And all of a sudden I ran, ran into all these folks I knew from the mystery world. I'm like, hey, I need to be here. Um, and you know, we, then we started talking about everything else under the sun, like Doctor Who and time travel and Victoriana and dress and costume and everything. So I, in, in, in case people don't know, Dana oh, yeah. was invested uh, in the uh, Baker Street Irregulars as the giant rat of Sumatra. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I thought it was because I wrote uh, a vampire that that line appears in um, the Sussex Vampire, and I thought it was because I wrote some vampire fiction. But um, mostly, it's the tradition because all the other rats, giant rats of Sumatra, who've come before me, have had senses of humor, and they seem to think that this would would work out for me too. And I'm like, <laughs> so far. And Esther, you are the royal. I, I am. I am the Imperial Palace at Peking. Yes. And Laurie is the red circle. <laughs> Very nice. I am the red circle. You are someone, the red circle. Someone mentioned that in the comments. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. We have about 10 minutes left. How about some um, questions? Anyone up for questions? Let's see. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Greetings. Greetings. I think Diane Hi. has one. Oh, yeah, it was a good one. Um, could you each name a little known but really amazing historic resource that has come in handy for you while writing one or another of your books? I have one right away I can I, I can talk about. Um, if there is a diary written by someone of the period, mm -hmm. I want yeah. that. I like reading diaries is practically why I became an historical archaeologist because like <laughs> you have to. Yeah. Um, but also the old Oxford, um, yeah, the Oxford English Dictionary has a history of the words 
from the time they entered the English language. And when I'm doing some kind of resource, I love looking at that because you get intonations and there's also uh, examples from the literature. And that tells me what other literature I might be needing to look at to study that period as well. So do you have the one that's this thick that you have to read with a magnifying glass? Yes, because I couldn't afford like the 28 volume one. My house does not accommodate that, but yep, I've had it for, for a long time now. Laura, you're holding up something cool there. What was that? Uh, I was just, this is the, no. I buy, anytime I'm writing a book, I, I buy the um, uh, Baedeker's so Guide to the, so that one's, I, I mean, I have a whole row of Baedeker's. You can see them there. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, maps, of course. Mm -hmm. And I love going, I mean, I'm a book person. You can do some great research online, but I'm a book person and I love going into bizarre little bookstores and you find odd things that are, you know, from England and the rest of it. But it's also great to have every so often there's a reproduction of something like the, you know, the Sears oh, robot. Yeah. And this is, yeah. you know, it's slightly out of my date because it's 1927, but it's close enough. And, uh, you know, you can look at it and say, well, this is what, uh, you know, I mean, if you're writing, if you're writing the aristocracy, it's not what they would wear, but these are what common people did have and the middle class could afford and it sort of gives you a picture of what was actually in houses at the time so they're all great fun if um if mine's earlier than that i will look i will i will let you know because i have i have an uh, i think i my edition is early sj you have a cat the cat bella <laughs> let's say yes. uh, laurie that's very um bella, bella loves uh zoom uh zoom. <laughs> It, it's very Amelia Peabody of you to have the Baydeckers. Yeah. Uh, um, Elizabeth Peters, I, wonderful yeah. historical novels. Yeah. And every so often you'll buy one that ha that's annotated by somebody. So that mm. the India one um, was owned by a soldier who was stationed uh, mm -hmm. just, just near where it, it, the part, and every so often there'd be some little comment in there. The old Baydeckers okay. are great because they, they're actually personal experiences of the people who went there. And you, I mean, you can feel the sincerity with which they write, you know, that the divans in the guest room are infested with fleas. <laughs> I'm sure that was heartfelt. <laughs> uh, with, um, mid, I, I don't have anything as, as uh, academic as that, but more pedestrian. But um, I like postcards. I mean, when you're dealing with the, the mid 20th century, and um, so eBay is, you know, it, this unknown um, website called eBay <laughs> oh. has been really helpful for me. For, How do you I, spell that? I get ephemera there um, as well as maps. And, mm -hmm. and then with postcards, many of them, you know, there's things written, you know, in that in, you know, and signed in that particular time. So that gives kind of the flavor that, that Lori was alluding to. And then even things like, you know, Ancestry.com, which y'all know, but if you're doing mid uh, 20th century, like people keep adding things to it. So, you know, there was this whole yearbook from 1939 from the high school that I needed it from, you know, in, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, if, if it was uh, pre pandemic, I would have gone to that high school and, you know, looked through their history and, and I didn't have to move from my computer. So that was kind of nice. Very cool. I wouldn't have thought about that, but um, I can imagine that that yearbooks and such would be perfect because, um, apart from looking at my own with my '80s hair and everything, um, but you're gonna have everyone's like, you're gonna have all the things that they felt were important or laughable. Well, what they were wearing. What right? they were wearing. What they were. Yeah. What plays they were doing. Exactly. Which yeah. I used. I actually used that. Nice. Sj. Yeah. Um. I. I want to give a, a shout out to uh, Delta State University in Cleveland, Mississippi, which has a museum of Mississippi Delta Chinese mm. and uh, was, was very helpful. And a uh, Facebook page that, again, the famous Eric Stone uh, got me admitted to, got me a member of, uh, Mississippi Delta Chinese are us. And the people on it are either still in the Delta, but mostly are descendants of you know they grew up as kids in the delta and now have have uh, left and they post recipes and photographs and 
obituaries and really, really uh, a very uh, granular stuff mm -hmm. that a lot of it I was, it, it, it all kind of filters into my head as background. Most of it I, I haven't used, but uh, there were a couple of, of kind of book changing things that I found. So that was the most unexpected resource was that Facebook page. And, uh, and the, um, uh, the mu museum, I, I guess it's called an archive, but they do have museum exhibits permanently up. So stuff. That. stuff. So many stuff. things are digitized now. It's quite remarkable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We have a question for you, Laurie, from Susan. Uh, is there any chance you'll write another book with Mahmoud and Ali? Anything's possible, sure. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a planner, I header. I, I'm a pantser myself, a chaotic pantser. Um, SJ, are you a, a pantser? Organic. Or? The phrase organic. is organic. You're organic. an organic writer, Dan. Twining, oh, yeah. like, and it's not like, it's not crazy like physics. Yeah. I'm, I'm an organic writer also. I don't plan ahead, but I have to say that the one I'm writing now with a partner, Mm -hmm. His job, well, his job, before he found me, he'd already written a 16-page single-spaced outline, which he sent me. It's true. And uh, I kind of, it included not just the kitchen sink, but the kitchen sink from the next door apartment. Um, I, I had to pare it down, but it does have an arc. And so I find myself writing to an arc, which I have never done. Mm. Uh, a little arc. Um, and you know, it's great. It's, it's great if somebody else hands you an outline. The problem is to have, he came up with the outline, but he doesn't write prose, you know? I can't think in outlines and also write prose. So I don't think I will ever be able to do that. Uh, so if somebody asked me, will you ever write a book about, I, you know, I cannot say. Naomi, are you uh, a, 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 an organic writer or an outliner? I'm a, a reformed <laughs> pantser. Um, yeah, I, I, I like to journal. I do hmm. some organic thinking, but it, it eventually things kind of stand out and then I can make the jump. So hmm. I think I'm processing. I do process internally, but then at a certain point, I think I do kind of start to do the structures. You know, it's not real detailed, but I, I do need some tent poles here and there mm -hmm. to lay the canvas down. Yeah. It also depends on the kind of book, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. I mean, if you're um, uh, the, kind, the kind of book that has to follow a certain pattern, that is this person knows this and it's very tightly structured and then this person has to know that. And that, I mean, that's almost impossible without some kind of timeline or outline or you know just a list of then and then and then and then kind of things yep. so the one that i'm doing now is very much that i mean i have a, a sort of timeline which i'm forever getting to and thinking i i don't know how this works <laughs> there's something here somewhere um i we have just a few minutes left so i'd like to ask you what is next when is your next thing coming out and what are you working on after that and what whatever goodness you want to share with us please do well, I, I, already, <laughs> I already said, um, I've got a, a standalone suspense in two phases. It's coming out in probably September uh, next year. Um, and it's, uh, it's partially set in the 70s in the Bay Area and partially set in modern days. And it's also got sections of it that is... Um, chapters of, of of evidence, so it's kind of like the documents in the case. So oh, cool. it's a complicated book, and I'm having a good time with it because I I get to revisit my hippie past. There you go. And and Castle Shade, of course, came out earlier. Um, that this came month. in June. Yeah, it came in June. Okay, SJ, how about you? What's what's next? Uh, the the book coming out December first is Family Business. Uh, the the that's the the cover of which is is was in the uh, publicity for for this event uh it's available i i don't it's not even available for pre-order yet it's coming out in december 
but it's done. It's a Bill Smith, Lydia Chin. Uh, well, it's a Lydia Chin, Bill Smith, because Lydia narrates it set in Chinatown, uh, set in Chinatown. And of course, this being New York, uh, it's, it or, it's organized around everybody wanting the same building because mm -hmm. it's New York, it's yeah. real estate. Uh, after that, currently I'm working on the murder of Mr. Ma, but there will also be a uh, Bill Smith book following probably uh, for next December uh, called uh, the mayor, the mayors of New York. So, so we're keeping you off the street, basically. So, I'm sorry. You're staying off the street, basically. You're working. I'm you staying, know. staying off the street. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're keeping me. Uh, they found no other way to keep me off the street than, than to uh, make me work. So, uh, so here I you. am. <laughs> now that improves. Yeah, <laughs> Naomi, uh, Clock and Division comes out in a couple of weeks. In August, and August. Um, yeah, so I I have signed a contract to do a follow up. So Yay. I've been journaling. It's called Evergreen. So I have to yeah launch into writing it, but but that book won't come out probably. It won't come out next year. Next year will be a Hawaii book that's in the can, and then a middle grade nonfiction book. Well, that I'm working on right now. Um, oh, very it's, cool. Yeah, biographies. Middle, middle grade nonfiction about what? It's um, on uh, Asian American profiles, like 30, 30 Asian, you know. Yeah, so I get to write about very diverse people. I'm learning a lot. Yay. I'm learning a lot. So well, that's good for me. <laughs> I mean, just the difference between um, Maserai and um, Leilani Santiago. Yeah, and the characters in Clark and Division. I mean, there's, I mean, you you've you already got that, so I mean, I can imagine that you're just going to take it and, and run with it. But that's very cool. Um, let's see. I let's uh, Pandora's Orphans. Yay, hello, Birdie. Um, comes out uh, July thirteenth. Uh, and we'll be doing a few more events to celebrate its launch next week about the same time about the same back channel i.e. my author page on Facebook, I'll be chatting with uh, Charlene Harris and Tony Keller. Wow. Uh, and so we're going to have fun because uh, we don't we haven't seen each other a lot uh, in the past uh, year and a half. So um, it'll be good to hang out. We'll talk about urban fantasy and mystery, and I hope uh, you all come by. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for um, chatting me with us. It was awesome. It's Thank great. you. Thank yeah, you for having us. Fun. Oh, my pleasure. All yeah, making your own person. Almost Sorry? As good as, just to see all you guys together, it's almost as good as being in the same room. Oh, Not no. quite close. Well, left, left Coast Crime next year. Oh. Left Coast Crime is in Albuquerque? Yeah. yeah. Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Ooh. See you in Albuquerque. And you then the, the basketball court's next year, Minneapolis, right? Minneapolis? For, um, Khan, Minneapolis? Khan. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Basketball, yeah. No, right? No basketball in New Orleans this year. No, of course. Of course. People, but, um, yeah. But yeah, basketball yeah. in uh, in uh, wherever. <laughs> I love the fact that you're training this prize. Dead and I forget, but I don't care. Minneapolis. <laughs> Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you there. The two shortest Yay! people on this panel will be there. <laughs> Yay, normality. <laughs> so Naomi, Laurie, SJ, thank you yeah. so much again, and thank you everyone thank for you. stopping by. Really yeah, appreciate thank it. You, so thank bye you all. Bye. Uh, and uh, this will be available, I think, on Facebook and also on my YouTube channel. But um, thanks again for everyone to stop by. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.